This is Dennis Ramundi. I'm here with my co-host, Phil Goldberg, our podcast and now YouTube channel, Spirit Matters Talk, found at spiritmatterstalk.com. And if you go to YouTube, just type in three words, Spirit Matters Talk, and we'll be there. Uh, and uh, whether you're listening or watching, please uh, hit the subscribe button. We'd appreciate that. Uh, and those that have contributed to keep us on the air, we thank you. And uh, if anybody wants to do that, please go to Spirit Matters Talk dot com and the information on how to do that is there and uh we're not a, a non-profit uh, it is a contribution not a donation but it, it will be greatly appreciated and uh you also uh have anybody even if you're not subscribing has access to our uh archives which has have about i don't know 300 plus shows in there now and uh our guest today uh, uh back on the show uh very happy to have him mas vidal he is a yogi he is a mystic and a practitioner of Ayurveda. Uh, Mas has become an influential teacher, speaker, and author of Ayurveda, yoga, and Vedantic philosophy. A uh, very diverse background, very knowledgeable in many, many areas that we've covered with other folks here. Uh, Mas seems to have a real overview. And I was going through their website, your website, and many courses that you offer where if somebody wants to commit 50 hours or 200 hours or 300 hours, one can go uh, in slightly deeply and one can go in very deeply. And uh, Phil, if you could uh, introduce uh, Moss's new book. Yes, new book. Hold it to your, yeah. The yeah, they, Evolution they, Revolution, <laughs> Yoga, it. Ayurveda, and the Rise of the Soft Power Culture, Moss Vidal. Moss, right. welcome back. And I, I want to say one other thing in the introduction, yes. that is we have many folks on who are academicians who uh, talk about Vedic philosophy. From an academic standpoint, we have practitioners. Uh, Moss is both. He is both a practitioner and an expert, or uh, I would put him on a level of a, an academic in terms of his knowledge. So uh, thank you very much. An, an academic on. without an academy to... Uh, <laughs> to <laughs> inhibit his teaching he's, and tell him He's what probably, to probably like me. I bet when you go to India, they think you're a professor. They call you professor. And... Yes, well, I do teach at a university in India. Oh, okay. So you are a legitimate academic. I legitimate. I, they only think I am. So, <laughs> Moss, welcome back. Uh, the first time you were on, uh, we began by asking you about your own spiritual background. So I will uh, spare you having to repeat that and refer our listeners and viewers to uh, our first interview with Moss. Uh, at that time, you were here speaking about your first book, Sun, Moon, and Earth. Um, now you have this second book, The Evolution Revolution. So let's begin with that. Why a second book? Uh, what prompted it? And uh, what's the purpose? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Well, that first book um, was a bit more technical. Um, I felt that I really wanted to give Yogananda a lot of credit for his influence, particularly with regards to the yoga um, the asana, the whole the whole package of yoga that he brought to the to the West, um, and to show the connection that uh, that had with uh, Ayurveda. Um, this book is uh, more philosophical, um, even though I have been a student, if you will, of Vedanta for uh, close to thirty years. Um, it was always for me very um, th theoretical. And I never understood Vedanta until uh, more recently, more recently being the last, I would say, eight to 10 years, um, I began to understand Vedanta as a living practice, as something that you integrate in your mindset and is an integral part of lifestyle. So I wanted to bring that forth and the, the timing of the book uh, it's really good uh, because I really wanted to get it out before this whole pandemic uh, was over uh, because I contrast the difference between a Vedic evolution or what I refer to as cyclical evolution and the scientific perspective of evolution, 
which looks at evolution in, in a linear way. So that we came from a very dark place. We weren't very intelligent. We, as uh, humans or Neanderthals becoming Homo sapiens, we slowly developed our cognition and then um, now we're the smart race. And um, I disagree with that. And I sort of contrast that with the Vedic perspective, which relies on the yuga theory that uh, life and human life on earth is cyclical. So that's, that, that's basically the whole intention of the book and to um, encourage people to question, are you evolving? Are you living an evolutionary life? And what defines real evolution? So um, I, find, I found that that, that that question was uh, very skewed, <laughs> if you will. <laughs> so. I, I have a question. Uh, it, yeah. When uh, folks in the West uh, think of evolution, they think of Darwinian evolution and uh, human beings being around for, uh, you know, uh, different theories on it when they actually popped up, the Neanderthals, uh, modern, what they call modern man, so on and so forth. But we're talking about uh, an, a period of time that's minuscule in, 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 in relation to uh, the yugas, that I think the shortest yuga is at 400,000 years, 400 plus thousand years, or, uh, 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 or, or maybe it's 240,000, something like that, but some enormous numbers. So how, when you are uh, asked that question, how does one relate to the other? Are they both true? Uh, does one fit into the other? How do you respond to that? I think they're both true, except that the scientific or the linear model only takes a piece of time on Earth and doesn't look at the whole world as what Vedanta refers to as the world process, that souls keep coming back to the planet Earth. You don't live one life, you mm -hmm. live, as Yogananda said, on average a million embodiments so um, that's a cycle in itself. You keep coming back to work out your desires and your um, challenges. So, so, so that model, that science model is limited. It's a small fraction, it's a small uh, portion of, of the, the whole of creation. And the yuga looks at it in a much more profound way, and Vedanta looks at it in the more in a more profound way. So that's a, that's a great question, though. No one's asked that. <laughs> um, Moss, dig a little deeper into um, uh, your take on evolution, and uh, another difference I would think is the uh, our sense of evolution in Darwinian terms. What what kids learn about in school is uh, predominantly, if not exclusively, physical. So how does um, the mind, the non-physical aspects of existence, consciousness, and so forth, fit in to a theory of evolution? Yes, that's, that's a brilliant concept. So here's the the basic uh, difference is the, 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 so this Western approach does focus on evolution more uh, based on the physical level, while evolution from the Vedic perspective is more mental. And um, this is why the book um, explores what the mind is uh, and what are the, the different aspects of the mind, the waking state, the subconscious state, the unconscious state, and then the superconscious state. And um, Patanjali uh, refers to these four states. He recognizes them as, as important uh, in, um, in our growth, in our understanding. And so basically it's not the, the cave man or the, the, the ape sort of hunching over and then eventually coming to a standing position, right? And then um, that's ev evolution. No, this is evolution in beginning to perceive the more subtle realms of human consciousness. What are those realms? Well, one is the intuitive capacity that the human mind has. Uh, also, uh, 
the Ramayana does much to explore the importance of devotion in the mind, right? Uh, we often think of devotion in the heart, but devotion is actually a mindset. It's a shift in the mind because what, what supports devotion is emotion. Emotion is the negative uh, aspect. It is the ego a developed aspect of the mind, but the same energy that fuels emotion is the same energy that we use for devotion and for the path of bhakti yoga. So the four yogas really present four aspects of uh, exploring our consciousness. And I simplify it in the book and put it in very simple lay terms as listen, the capacity we have to listen, karma yoga, learn, gyan yoga, love, bhakti yoga, and let go or surrender, uh, raj yoga. These are all capacities of consciousness. These are all powers that the mind has. And so this is the uh, evolution that I am trying to encourage us to understand. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, I was looking through uh, your, your, your website and fascinating and you, you have knowledge and you teach in the area of Ayurveda, Ayurvedic medicine, uh, uh, Vedic astrology, uh, Jyotish, uh, uh, meditation, uh, devotion. Uh, so on, on all these levels, all these things that affect human growth and evolution. So somebody watches the, the uh, interview today and they think, boy, this is great. I want to learn from this gentleman. Uh, uh, and they contact Moss and they, they ask you, uh, where do I start? Is there one point, do you start with Jyotish? Do you start with, with Vedic astrology? Do you start with meditation? Do you do it all at once? Where would you, uh, if somebody just said, point me in the right direction, get me started, what do you say? Yeah. Uh, well, this is something I highlight in the book. I think that one of the single most important uh, things that we can do as a human race to promote evolution is diet. I think it's something, why? Because it's something that everyone does. Everyone has to eat. And we know that the impact that diet has on our wellness, our not only our evolution, but our longevity. Uh, we know that diet affects the mind. And we can see that the world is very toxic, struggling with disease and struggling with the mental fear that we have because we're not healthy as a human race. We don't have immunity as a human race. Why we turn to vaccines that have only been around a few hundred years, but yet human life has existed for hundreds of thousands of years. And in fact, Ayurveda recognizes that humans were living on average 100 to 120 years. And that was over 2000 years ago. That was during the time of Patanjali, Charaka, uh, Shushruta, these greats. Um, and so we have actually downgraded as a human culture in our capacity to have immunity, to have health. So I think it really starts with a very basic thing. Change your diet, follow a plant-based diet as much as you can, depending on your medical conditions and uh, begin there. I think that's pretty simple. Well, well, I would just like to uh, follow that with uh, what you're also ingesting is the air you breathe and uh, everything else that's coming into the system that you, that's not necessarily going through the digestive system, but you are consuming. And I would think that um, the two would be tied together that obviously uh, if somebody wanted yeah. tremendous longevity, it would also be very affected by the atmosphere that they were in. Yeah. Well, here's a perfect example, you know, in, in medicine or modern medicine or the, the modern movement of health and wellness, what do we measure in food? We measure vitamins, we measure minerals, we measure protein, carbohydrates. That's not important to us in the evolutionary field, in the yogic field. What's important to us is prana. You can't measure prana. Right. Define it, Moss, for our listeners. 
So prana is a is the equivalent to the chi, the, the term chi in, in the Chinese tradition. Prana is um, how food, water, and air are able to hold consciousness. Prana comes from light. Light is the light of consciousness. And what uh, holds light or the energy that, that is contained in light is the vibration of pure consciousness. So this is, so there's three tiers. We look at it uh, as pure consciousness or call it God, Brahman, um, the, the eternal energy of, that upholds the world. Then we have light and that light we see disseminated through the sun, the seven major planets. And then that light comes into what? Oxygen life on earth and it comes through here uh, for us to breathe prana we drink prana because there's prana in water right as the light hits the water and there is prana in the soil which produces our foods so oh. so prana is more important than vitamin and this is where um, when a person is following a plant-based diet or, or a diet that is seasonal or in accordance to their body type, they are uh, growing in their capacity to evolve. Why? Because their vessel, their body, their mind-body complex is growing in its capacity to hold prana. That is evolution. What we're doing is making this container, this entity more worthy to hold consciousness. Prana is the gasoline that carries consciousness. Okay, since you're talking about the things we consume, I have to confess that when I looked at your table of contents, my attention was drawn to a chapter with chai in the title. Oh, I saw that too. There's especially yeah, there's a Because <laughs> I love my chai. Yeah. And I was surprised by what I read. So now this, this may not sound spiritual on a show called Spirit Matters, but everything, <laughs> everything in your book and everything associated with yoga and Ayurveda has a spiritual connotation. And so tell us, Tell, tell us a little bit about chai. <laughs> so chai is a spice drink. Chai, the word chai actually means tea. So when you go to a lot of restaurants or Starbucks, they'll say, have a chai tea. So basically they're just saying tea tea, right. have a tea tea. So, um, so the, these spices, the main spices that are used in, in chai are are very commonly used spices in Ayurveda that help to promote digestion. The very basic structure where Ayurveda emphasizes health begins is with digestion, the metabolic process. So as we improve digestion, we improve our capacity to digest food and, and increase our health and longevity. So the, the main spices like ginger, black pepper, cardamom, uh, cinnamon, these are all excellent spices to drink in the morning because they get the agni going. Agni means the metabolism, the secretion of enzymes into the gut. And, um, but what happened is, you know, with colonial um, uh, invasions, and we know India has gone through more invasions of, of, of empir em empirical uh, uh, emp empirical rulers than any other country, um, the British came in, they hijacked the chai, and they um, also began to add black tea to the chai. That was not an original Indic practice. Black tea was not something that was uh, very commonly drank in India. Um, it existed in different parts. Um, um, but like Earl Grey's and all of these, you look at most of those teas, those are all British. And the British used India 
as a way to manufacture and produce more tea in the world than anywhere else. And they shipped it out of India and sold it to other countries. Um, it's strongly believed that it was actually that the Portuguese had their hand in that as well. And the Portuguese took this sort of new hybrid of chai, which includes the spices with the black tea, and they took it over to Portugal. Um, and so there's a little debate as to whether um, who got it out first. Uh, but the point is, is that Ayurveda doesn't typically like people to drink stimulating uh, type things that have caffeine. Why? Because they stir, disturb vata. They influence the nervous system and they make the mind um, more active. And that takes away from health. It takes away from the balance and the calmness of the nervous system. What a shame. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I got to tell you, if you try my version of chai that has no black tea, has a little bit of turmeric and a little bit of a, of a mineral pitch called shilaji, you will never go back. It's amazing. Um, I'll get the recipe. Okay. <laughs> we, should we should post it up. <laughs> I, I wanted to ask up. Uh, uh, I read that you were you were you were influenced most by the lineages of Parma Mahatsa Yogananda, and uh, also Swami Jyotir Mayananda. I believe the pronunciation. Who was the last direct disciple of Swami Shivananda? Uh, I I like m most of our listeners. I think would be more familiar with Yogananda. Maybe maybe there are many that are familiar with your other influence. Uh, tell us about. Yeah, so uh, in my childhood neighborhood of South Florida, um, I later discovered, not when I was young, that there was a sage living in South Miami. Um, he was one of the closest disciples to uh, Sri Swami Shivananda Maharaj, the great, the very well known of the Divine Life Society in mm -hmm. Rishikesh. And actually, it was Swami Jyotir Mayananda that transcribed most of Shivananda's books. Mm. He lectured, uh, he was the main lecturer at the Vedanta Forest Academy, uh, mm -hmm. which was created by Shivananda. And he spent 10 years with Shivananda. He took sannyas with Shivananda at the age of 22. And he came to the West um, and landed in Miami in 1969. He's now 91 years old. In my view, he is the foremost proponent of Vedanta that we have alive today. He has done commentaries on um, 10 of the major Vedantic texts um, from the Ramayana, Yoga Vashista, the Gita, on and on. He has uh, countless hours, over uh, 1,200 hours of recorded satsangs on his website. And I have fortunately been able to spend the last about 14 years uh, with him. I meet with him regularly. And um, he uh, was humble enough to write the foreword, the short and sweet foreword to the book. And as I said, his influence and um, his teaching helped me to understand Vedanta, not as just some philosophy, not as just a bunch of word jargon that uh, most people get into arguing over this and that, these different forms of Vedanta. To him, there is one Vedanta. And that Vedanta that is that there is one truth, one God alone exists. And he says that, that all of the, the um, this, uh, these arguments are really have nothing to do with the original Vedanta. And this predates the Shankara Vedanta. This is much earlier than the Shankara, Adi Shankara, who's probably the most uh, famous of proponents of Vedanta. And um, so he really helped me understand Vedanta as a living practice. He knew that I was a practitioner of Kriya Yoga. Um, he actually was at the ashram when Dayamata was uh, Yogananda's successor, visited the ashram in 1955. Um, and he was aware of Yogananda. He was alive, still alive. You know, he was born in the 30s. So 
he knew of Yogananda's presence in the West. But I have to say, he's not interested in recognition. He's not interested in anything else except uh, getting people to samadhi and to experience the truth through the scriptures, through studying the scriptures. Um, and that's uh, this book to me is a reflection of studying these scriptures with him, thankfully. Well, thank you for that, Moss. He obviously doesn't seek recognition because I'm supposed to be an expert on the gurus who came to America. And until I knew you, I never, I didn't know about him. Right. Um, so uh, we're grateful. You know, we know of other uh, of Shivananda's devotees, especially Swami Satchidananda, but... Uh, they were close buddies. They were close Yeah, I would buddies. imagine. Oh, interesting. In fact, Satchidananda visited him in Miami um, a number of times. I've seen photographs of, of him and very humble, very humble ashram, very small. They do have uh, a presence in India. He was born in Bihar and um, uh, he's just uh, to me remarkable. And so I hope that this book will help draw more people to his great teachings. I hope he has an online presence despite his age. He has young people putting his stuff online, I hope. Well, uh, they're, they're not so young. That's uh, <laughs> <laughs> younger. <laughs> well, there, there are some younger <laughs> ones, but they, I mean, it's amazing. He has a website called vedanticwisdom.org, over 1,200 hours of satsangs on 10 different wow. Vedantic scriptures. That's great. Thank yeah. you. Yes. Getting back to your book, um, it, yeah, we yeah, never yeah. judge Both. a book by its cover, but I want to ask you about this cover, uh, which is a very uh, enchanting uh, depiction of Lakshmi. Tell us about why you chose that and what Lakshmi means, why, why the symbolism for this book. Yeah, that's, that's a, it's a big topic. Uh, why her? Because um, my my big um, uh, I, I, where my heart lies in all of this is the balance of sun and moon. Um, I feel that the Abrahamic religions have taken a toll on uh, human culture, and much of this has to do with a a number of changes that occurred in the calendar. Um, the calendar that most of the world began to follow because of the Romans. This was a decision that the Romans made. Um, we follow what is known as the tropical uh, zodiac, and we follow a calendar that is based on the sun, on the sun's position. And um, the image on the front of the book is Lakshmi. She's known as Bhumi Devi. That term means goddess of the earth, that the earth has um, an intrinsic feminine quality. Hence the yoga tradition and the worship of the 10 goddesses and the tantric uh, um, wisdom traditions known as the Dasha Mahavidya. And if you look at most of the great pioneers that came to this country, um, worshiped the goddess, Ramakrishna, Kali, uh, Vivekananda, Kanyakumari, Yogananda, Kali, um, uh, Lahiri Mahashai, Durga, um, uh, Shivananda was strong co connection to uh, uh, Saraswati, but very much devoted to Krishna. And so the, we have disregarded the lunar tradition. We have forgotten about why it's important to look at the solely lunar um, calendar. And this to me has influenced uh, maleism, patriarchal uh, uh, rule in countries where governments are led by uh, male figures. Um, and we have made uh, or given men a sort of a priority in our society. And I think it needs to be the reverse. Uh, and part of the issue that we're seeing today is look at the way that we treat the earth. Look at the way that we uh, look at our ecological record as a human race, particularly the last 
thousand to two thousand years. We have destroyed this earth. Where humans go, everything goes. We kill. We 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 sap um, the, the the all the resources from these areas, and we're destroying this earth. And the main point here is that the earth is divine. We're not here to save the earth. We're here to look at the earth as a part of our divine relationship and to recognize that what exists and what sustains all living things, that includes animals and the plant kingdom, uh, the oceans, the rivers, all of these things is consciousness. It is the same consciousness that supports human life. Therefore, we have to live as equals on this planet. And um, I find that the yoga Ayurveda traditions are doing that. That's why I'm, I'm recognizing that the soft powers of India, not the hard powers, right? The soft powers of the great Vedic culture, these are the wisdom traditions, are now coming into the forefront of, of uh, modern culture, governments are recognizing it, and they're spreading throughout the world. Keep in mind the yoga tradition, very much a solar-based tradition. We call it a sadhana-based tradition. It's a discipline tradition. Ayurveda, lunar-based because it aims to, to nurture the relationship that humans have with nature. Nature is mother. Mother brings devotion, sentient qualities, and compassion for life on earth. Thank you. Uh, Phil, any, uh, uh, any, any final questions? Yes, I, I can't resist. <laughs> Go ahead. Moss, Moss, your yeah. book is, is, is over 330 pages, tucked away at the very end, so only truly diligent, devoted readers will find it. Like Phil, yeah. Yes. Is a section on celibacy and sex. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us, if you will, what the perspective is there. The nation awaits breathlessly. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so interesting that you recognize that. And I specifically to put, chose to put that at the very end in a, in a very secluded, private place. <laughs> you didn't want to lose the readers in the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> No, um, you know, it's a brilliant question. Um, and again, um, a lot of this has to do with the mind. And we've become a culture that is fascinated with the externalities of life. We, um, we have the largest divorce rates in the world now that we've ever seen. And America's lead this. If you look, Google lowest divorce rates in the world, who do you guess has those? India. And part of this brahmacharya or this um, control um, or a moderation of the sexual urge um, has a twofold benefit. One is that um, unless that energy is curbed to a certain degree, um, and you're practicing yoga, yoga goes against you. Yoga becomes a form of fitness, and yoga will drive you crazy, basically. Why? One energy wants to go down and out. Another energy wants to go in and up. They're juxtaposed to each other. And they, the two don't play in the same field. Shivananda has made some very bold statements. The Hatha Yoga texts, the Pradipika and Shiva Samhita, others refer to caution. If you're doing these things, um, and it's not just limited to sex, but diet and other modern uh, lifestyle uh, practices, uh, do not continue to practice the yoga because it will create a lunatic. It will drive you crazy. The energies will actually start to battle themselves and you'll create an inner war inside of your mind. 
And I've seen this as a practitioner of Ayurveda, I have seen people crippled, crawling for help. Their bodies don't work anymore. They're so fatigued, they don't even sleep well anymore. And um, uh, much of this has to do with this uh, issue. We're oversexed, we're overstimulated, and immunity is the basis for um, sexual energy. That energy contains the most powerful aspects of our immune system. I tell many uh, married couples this, I tell many individuals in the single life this, that you have to curb that energy. Otherwise you cannot fix the other problems you have, right? Because that is a major resource there that sustains your immunity and your longevity. And this is the basis for yoga and Ayurveda. Both share common interests. One wants you to evolve and to have samadhi, happiness, that's yoga. The other one wants you to have health and longevity, that's Ayurveda. Well, well, well put. Uh, any, uh, we should wind up. Any, any final points you'd like to leave with our uh, listeners and viewers? Yes, I would say, um, you know, you don't have to read my entire book to get something from it. And um, as uh, Dennis asked the question, where, where's an easy place to start? Start by making better health choices in your life. Start by eating better. Do something that you can do in the most consistent manner. It's not how long you do something, but how consistently you do it. And so if it's going to be meditation, do five minutes a day for the rest of your life rather than one year of intense meditation, right? So it's that little bit. Make it practical. Make it easy and make it work for you, but start somewhere. We have to be responsible for our own health. We have to be responsible for our own evolution. We can't expect anyone to save us. We can't expect the government to save us, your insurance policies to save you. You have to save yourself. And to me, yoga and Ayurveda are the highest forms of of evolution and the practices that we can use for for this in our life. All right. Thank you. Thank so you, much. Moss. Thank you. Thank if you. If the listeners and viewers want uh, specific advice about all these things we talked about, don't ask Dennis and me. <laughs> I'll write to Moss on his website. Read. This book. And we'll have we'll have the information on the book and, and the um, website, all that posted up. And yeah, yeah, and uh, I want to say that I'm grateful that you all are do that. There are podcasts that are specifically dedicated to spirituality. I was thinking about that. Um, there's so much junk out there, and there's so much that people can continue to pollute their minds with. But shows like this. Um, inspire people and provide people with um, uh, opportunities and uh, wisdom and channels to grow. And, um, and you all are, are, are an amazing, you're like a library uh, for, for these traditions. So I'm grateful that uh, you're giving us people like me a voice. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, Moss. And thank you for the work that you do and the knowledge that you, you spread. Okay. And we'll be in touch and uh, keep up the good work. Good luck with the book. Thank you so much. You. All the best to you all. Namaste. Namaste. Back on the show, Mas Vidal. Uh, really a brilliant guy all around uh, academically. Really a scholar. Knows his stuff and a real practitioner, very committed, very devoted. And I would think an excellent teacher uh, based on our conversations with him, uh, very clear, um, uh, speaks to whatever level of interest or knowledge the listener has. So I, th I thought he came across uh, quite, quite, quite well.
but based yeah, on no, the um, students of his I've met, I think that's uh, accurate. Right. And also, I wanted to ask you, Phil, he mentioned that uh, he went through a transition in the last few years uh, in regard to his understanding or of Vedanta, where it became, and, and I, we, I should have pursued that a little bit more with him about how it became more sort of built into his life and his lifestyle, although I think his lifestyle has been very much committed to Vedantic teachings for uh, a, quite a long time. Yeah, he's a, you know, Moss has been a yogi most of his adult life, as far as I could tell, um, has, you know, taken, he's learned the practices in the Yogananda's Kriya Yoga tradition. He's drawn from other lineages and other traditions. He seems to be having a very well-rounded approach to his own uh, path and is, you know, quite an expert on uh, not just yoga and yoga philosophy, but um, Ayurveda and Jyotish, Vedic mm -hmm. astrology, and um, just, you know, sort of a holistic approach, drawing from all different aspects of, of what we think of as the Vedic tradition. I don't know the details of how his understanding of Vedanta uh, changed, but I do know there's a lot of people who, you know, study Vedanta, look into Vedanta as a, a philosophical uh, foundation for much of, you know, Indian uh, spirituality, um, but aren't, don't necessarily um, uh, utilize the practices that can be drawn from the Vedantic tradition. Um, they, it's just a philosophical uh, a, a framework for them. So maybe it had something to do with that. Maybe he learned new things. I was interested in, you know, there's different, different forms of Vedanta, and there is a lot of debate, you know, mm -hmm. with what's the right, right. Is, is, Advaita Vedanta, which is what most of us know, this non-dual framework mm -hmm. of uh, of uh, Advaita meaning not two. And then there's Dvaita, which is a dualistic Vedanta, and Vashishta, uh, Vasista Advaita. <laughs> I, I it it sounds like uh, And, and like... there's so there's nuances, and people argue, and you know, some of well, the. We, we shouldn't be surprised. Are... I mean, if you look at Western religions and Christianity and Judaism, <clears throat> there's different perspectives on it by people yeah, who consider this themselves is, practitioners, you know. This, this is, you know, talking about the nature of reality and uh, some of the most learned people I've seen, the Swamis, and, and you know, they don't think there's a, a contradiction. What they see are three or four different ways of looking at reality. Right, right. right. As, at the same reality. You know, or oh, right. the same reality. Yeah, I, I had a question about Masvidal. Is he? Uh, can, does he consider himself a monk? And does he live? If if so, does he live in a community, or does is he totally on his own? No, I, I don't. Mas is not. I, not to my knowledge. I mean, yeah, he he might have a sangha, you know, but he he's he's uh, a man in. He's in the world. He's a yogi in the world. Not a. He's he's not a. Uh, a sannyasi, or uh, uh, a, 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 notice his name uh, on the book. He has this uh, name that was given to him of Mahesh Ananda. And um, so people might think he's a Swami because they associate that Ananda with now, Swami. Bill, define what, it, what, what, what uh, makes a person a Swami. When are they given it's, that? It's a, you know, there's different lineages that do it differently, but it's essentially uh, being ordained, to use Western terms, by a senior Swami who will, you know, under the right conditions for the right person, say, okay, you, you, you are worthy you, and you're, it's right for you to take vows and be a Swami. And it usually entails, uh, a, you know, certain disciplines and commitments. Um, depending on the, mm -hmm. on the lineage. So, you know, it, 
it's like you could say it's like becoming a, a priest or something, but right. it's different. And, and you know, and but there are and, many lineages and probably different rules governing. Yeah, definitely things. different rules and stuff. Right. There are even householder swamis. Yeah. Well, some, what I, I like uh, uh, was I felt his message, his teaching is very. Uh, uh, he articulates very well. Uh, everything is uh, brought out in a way that's extremely understandable. Uh, he deals with what are one could see as contradictions in a way like you just put that not contradictions, but different perspectives. And I think uh, also got a lot of practical knowledge when you think of Jyotish, you know, astrology, uh, pranayama, breathing, meditation, uh, devotional practices, uh, yeah. diet his, right across the board. And his he's very well uh, grounded in Ayurveda and the link but which is not always recognized be, uh, between Ayurveda and yoga tradition um, and um, blends them. Uh, and, you know, Ayurveda is getting more and more popular and there's always uh, the, the um, danger of it being trivialized. You know, people pick, right. you know, cherry pick out of uh, right. Ayurveda, but he's well trained and well grounded, and uh, trains others to to be uh, practitioners of Ayurveda. All, all these things are relatively new. I first, I don't think uh, I heard of Ayurvedic medicine really until probably late '80s, around that time, mid late '80s. Yeah. I think that, when, I, I, when I, Deepak I, became I, famous, right, it it was in the context of. Uh, Ayurveda. Ayurveda and uh, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, you know, had him trained for that. He was just trained in Western medicine, but there, there were, uh, you know, Doctor Vasant Lad was here, you know, right. teaching, and others Westerners were doing Ayurveda, but it was very no one knew about it. Then Deepak became famous, and and that you know put Ayurveda on the yeah. map, so to speak. Right. And well, the other one, Maharishi brought out the Pachaveda. And e even to this day, I've heard, I hear very little about that, uh, yeah. you know, architecture and building in accord with the laws of nature and certain directions. And uh, that, that's a little harder to introduce into a yeah, society. We, we rebuild New York. To, well, it's yeah. hard enough to, you know, find a good place to live, let alone a perfectly <laughs> located and built, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there you go. Anyway. All right. Well, uh, uh, all right. Him back on again. He was uh, really Wonderful yep. guest. Who else do we have coming up, Phil? We have a lot of. We have. We're recording this uh, on February 9th. It'll be up in a few weeks. Twenty twenty two. So when twenty twenty two. So when people hear this, uh, they should know where we we have a bit of a backlog, and we have some really cool guests coming up. Great. Oh, and uh, hit the uh, whether you are listening or watching, hit the uh, subscribe button. And also, if you'd like to contribute, help keep us on the air, go to spiritmatterstalk.com and it'll tell you what to do. And again, we, I want to say we're not a nonprofit, so it's not a donation. It's a contribution. And go into our archives and um, learn all that you can learn. It's all there. But you can, you can tell the IRS it's important research for your work. Right. There you go. <laughs> all right. Good one. Hey, right. Until next time, Phil. Okay.